in today's space world, in today's commercial space world, you need to be more than just a great engineer. You need to be more than just a great business manager. You need to understand the breadth of space. You need to understand policy, how managing a company and an entrepreneurial a startup environment is different from the way you manage something in a, in a large aerospace company. Welcome to the Space Angels podcast, episode 10, The Reluctant Entrepreneur. I'm your host, Chad Anderson, CEO of Space Angels, the world's leading source of capital for early stage space ventures. The purpose of this podcast is to provide investors with the context and information necessary to understand the real risks and opportunities in this dynamic new entrepreneurial space age. Today's guest is Andy Aldrin, a true child of the Apollo era, son of Apollo 11 astronaut Buzz Aldrin, Andy's career has spanned nearly every aspect of the space economy, from big defense contractors to entrepreneurial space ventures and academia. As a graduate student in the 80s, he traveled to the then Soviet Union to study the behind the scenes factors that had boosted the USSR in the Cold War space race. He says the lessons he learned there influenced how he views American advancement in space, including entrepreneurship. After completing his PhD in political science and government at UCLA, he began his career with incumbents Boeing and ULA before moving into more entrepreneurial ventures and eventually becoming an associate professor at the Florida Institute of Technology. Hi, Andy. Welcome to the podcast. Hey, Chad. Good to be here. Thanks. So what was your first memory of space? Uh, yeah, well, I guess it was at a pretty young age. Probably as soon as we moved to Houston when I was five years old and dad was an astronaut so space was like right in front of me every day so considering that that it's been part of your life since very early and also that you've had a really unique career trajectory so you were business development and advanced programs for boeing's nasa systems and launch businesses you carried that similar position over to united launch alliance when they uh formed with lockheed you right been a consultant, um, and then you also ventured out and had some experience with startups yep. as an operator and an advisor. And so I'd like to hear a little bit more about that. And from your personal point of view, how have you managed that career trajectory and, and what influenced your decisions along the way? It's been a long, strange road. And actually, it goes back further than my days in industry. I began life as a Sovietologist. You know, many of your listeners out there may not even think such a thing ever existed, but I started out studying the Soviet Union and and I wrote my dissertation on how the Soviet Union beat the United States in space. And and it's actually kind of come full circle, things I'm doing today. But the remarkable story that there was in the Soviet Union was that it really was very much a story of entrepreneurship and a, a guy putting together an organization that was kind of a remarkable organization at the very bottom levels of the Soviet system and created a space system that the Soviet leadership didn't want. And he struggled on a daily basis, constantly selling the program, selling it at times as, a, as an anti-aircraft missile program, at other times as a ballistic missile program. And then finally, he got an opportunity to launch a satellite that nobody in the Soviet leadership cared about at the time. It wasn't until the success of Sputnik that Sergei Korolev really became known as the father of the Soviet space program. Just a remarkable story. And um, that was an interesting start to my career. And I was working at the Rand Corporation, having a great time. But then the Soviet Union went away. And so a lot of my research agenda went away. And I ended up helping out a few companies in Russia, uh, aerospace companies, understand something about what was going on there. And one of them TRW asked me to come and work for him in business development. And so then I ended up in the corporate world. And, you know, I kind of told myself jokingly I could deal with it for about 15 years, maybe. And, and it's kind of remarkable because I was at TRW, then Boeing, and then ULA for almost exactly 15 years. And that was a remarkable experience. And I learned a lot in that organization about what it takes not to just survive, but what it takes to have initiative to, you know, to be entrepreneurial within a very large organization. It's not set up to be entrepreneurial. And I think one of the, the real lessons I pulled out and I think some of the accomplishments that I had was helping brilliant engineers learn how to put together 
business concepts within you know a difficult organizational environment at Boeing and later ULA. So Andy, the organizational stuff aside, what does it mean exactly to be business development of advanced programs and launch business services? What was it that you were doing? It was really the whole front end of the business, if you will. So my tasks were business strategy, advanced programs, and business development. And so what I was doing for the chief executive was looking out into the future, figuring out where the markets were, trying to understand whether we had the right capabilities to meet those markets, developing strategies to try and capture those markets, and then where we needed to invest to develop capabilities to capture markets, then I would manage the investments and the advanced programs needed to create those capabilities. So it was really kind of everything that's looking forward in those organizations. Very interesting. That's way of thinking it. And then so after 15 years, uh, you decided to leave these cushy jobs and venture out a little bit. And so you made quite a, quite a change. Yeah, you know, um, some people joke with me that it wasn't really so much a, just a job change or even maybe a career change. It was like I changed life forms. I went from being a dinosaur to a small furry mammal. And life in a startup is is really, really different, but incredibly exciting. And I think one of the great things I took away from being president of Moon Express was that you can actually focus a number of people on a task and do incredible things. And, you know, literally with order of magnitudes, less time and with order of magnitudes, less resources than in a large company. And um, it's a pretty amazing experience in that way. And so you were with Moon Express for how long? Just about a year. Okay. And um, one year at Moon Express um, and a startup versus 15 years at um, a large player looking at future advanced concepts. Um, what were the big differences? <laughs> it's kind of interesting. One year at Moon X equals 15 years at, <laughs> at a big company. It's kind of like dog years. Yeah. Um, you know, the real difference between the two is in a big complex organization, you generally have a fairly narrow scope of responsibility. I mean, even if you've got a lot of stuff underneath you, it's your actual day to day job is pretty constrained in its scope. In a startup, everybody has to do everything. Everybody in a startup is constantly doing marketing, everybody is constantly doing communications. Um, everybody has to understand the basic business because everyone is making business decisions on how they spend extremely scarce resources. So, you know, it's a much more exciting and I think challenging environment that requires, I think, a much broader scope of talents and abilities than, than in a big company. A big company, you can just be a great engineer and you can keep your head down and do amazing things. In a startup environment, you have to be more than just a great engineer. Okay, so I really enjoy having this conversation with you now and hearing how you talk um, versus conversations from a year or a couple of years ago. So you have a lot of experience with incumbent space. And historically, you have been um, somewhat of a curmudgeon or a non-believer um, when it comes to the entrepreneurial space age. But I've seen you slowly becoming convinced. Um, and I'm curious, uh, what was it that changed your mind? What convinced you? And you know, what do you see that's different now than, than maybe was previously? So actually, ironically, at ULA, they called me the space curmudgeon, um, which is, you know, if you think about it, a, a pretty curmudgeonly sort of organization in general. Um, you know, the thing that has changed it is that over the last five years, I think it's the breadth and depth and scope of investment, the number of companies that are coming online, um, you know, just the sheer numbers of companies. And, you know, we're, we're talking about hundreds of companies and tens of billions of dollars being invested. So there is um, there is something very, very real happening. But I'll also tell you that the transition hasn't happened completely. You know, I gave a talk the other day talking about paradigm shifts as sort of scientific revolutions. And, you know, there's kind of a formal framework. And in looking at that, 
we're not through a paradigm shift yet. I think there's an, an awful lot that needs to happen. But where it is happening, I think fairly clearly, is on the small side, where you've got small satellites, small launch vehicles. Uh, I mean, I think that shift is underway. And so that's what convinces me. And so you mentioned a few things, a few data points, um, the number of companies and the amount of investment. Did you know about this before you read our investment quarterly? No, I have to admit, you guys have opened my eyes. I want more of your data. Absolutely. Love it. <laughs> no, I mean, I, and I think the community is doing a better job of getting that, that story out. You guys are yeah. doing a phenomenal job getting the story out. Um, but it really needs to get out there. What's happening here is real. As I've said before, we've got a ways to go. I think we need to see a lot more healthy exits. I think I would like to see more stability in terms of um, entry and exits in the industry. I think that, you know, as you've got very high levels of entry and exit, that, that tends to create kind of an unstable industry, which is a, not a great investment environment. And, you know, Chad, this is a conversation we've had a few times. I still I still think there are inflated valuations out there. And Certainly. That could be problematic. So I would like to see um, a little bit closer connection between, I think, reasonable projections of discounted cash flows and valuations. But none of these things are, are really that unusual in the early phase of an industry development. So it's all exciting. And yeah, it's real. Yeah. And um, we like to say is, you know, it's not a, um, an industry with a handful uh, of companies anymore, right? So there's, we're counting nope. 400 plus that have raised external financing. And, and it's that robustness that you mentioned earlier, that's really what gives the, the, the sector its strength. So totally agree. There's certainly some, um, some inflated valuations and some business models that we still need to see closed. And there's going to be some failures and some successes, but it's good to see that robustness because, because that demonstrates that it's going to carry on. Right. I read something that you, you said somewhere that I believe very strongly, you believe very strongly that Florida will be one of the key places for space entrepreneurship and that you have to go through Florida to get to space. Um, right. and you're not saying that just because you've got a soft spot for Florida and spend a lot of time there, right? Yeah. Uh, well, I, I suppose I do have a little bit of a vested interest, but, you know, one of the things that we're seeing is kind of a migration away from everything happening in Silicon Valley to other centers. And so Florida is one of the obvious centers. And if you're going to launch into space at some point, you're probably going to go through Florida. I mean, I realize there's a proliferation of new launch sites out there, but um, most of the launches that are going to be happening are still going to be coming out of Florida. And we're starting to see some real industrial development. You know, there's a road right outside of the Kennedy Space Center. It's called Space Commerce Boulevard. And in many ways, it's a metaphor for, for the business. And, and I'll tell you that for 20 years, Space Commerce Boulevard was empty. Maybe about 10 years ago, NASA built a facility there. Ultimately, NASA moved out of it. It was a facility for space station processing. It particularly was going to be doing commercial stuff on the space station. And that didn't really pan out. But now you drive down that and, you know, you've got one web, Blue Origin. Um, the old space station facility is now almost completely full. Mm -hmm. Space Commerce Boulevard is starting to fill up. And I think you'll see some other companies coming in there in the very near future. It's not going to be everything is in Florida, but a lot of things are in Florida. I think a good educational system. I think you've got relatively supportive state level government. You've got uh, a very, very well educated and um, uh, I think robust aerospace workforce there. So there's a lot mm -hmm. of good things about Florida. And um Yesterday, a lunar lander launched from Florida for the first time since Apollo 17. Um, yep. And this is exciting for a lot of reasons. Um, a another reason is that it was a, the first privately funded moon lander. Um, yep. It was launched on a private SpaceX rocket. And the launch was brokered by another private company, Spaceflight Industries. So how yep. significant do you think that was for Florida and for the broader space economy? 
But I want to start with just honestly a personal significance to it. Um, Morris Kahn, who financed um, a fair amount of that venture, is a personal friend and I think a committed space advocate. And so I, I got to give Morris a shout out because this was very important for him. I think the way you described it, though, Chad, is actually kind of perfect, that it is an example of, you know, a early private stack. Every payload that was on that was privately financed. So we're going to see a lot more of that in the future, and that's going to be really exciting to see. Cool. Okay, so, Andy, you are a learned man. Um, You have all kinds of degrees, uh, PhD in political science from UCLA, you have an MBA, you have an MA in science technology and public policy from George Washington, um, an MA in international relations um, from UC Santa Barbara. And now you find yourself back in academia um, yeah. as faculty, adjunct faculty at ISU, I think previously? Yeah. Okay. And then um, as an associate professor at the Florida Institute of Technology. Right. And um, you are um, the driving force behind a new space entrepreneurship program that will come to the Space Coast in the summer of 2019, the Center for Space Entrepreneurship. And the big question is, what's the purpose of this center and why is this the right time for this type of program? Yeah, so the, I, the purpose is kind of gets back to something I said a little bit earlier, that in today's space world, in today's commercial space world, um, You need to be more than just a great engineer. You need to be more than just a great business manager. You need to understand the breadth of space. You need to understand policy. You need to understand how managing a company in an entrepreneurial startup environment is different from the way you manage something in in a large aerospace company. And, you know, by the same token, I think large aerospace companies need to understand that if they are going to continue to be the leaders in this field, um, they're going to have to learn how to innovate and behave more entrepreneurially themselves. So I think there's a real demand for a breadth of a program. And what we put together is something that it's a program that's designed to serve as a as a portion of a master's degree. So what we have is, is a certificate program of four courses in space policy, commercial programs, technology and systems, and then, you know, putting teams together to actually develop business ideas in an entrepreneurship course. And and the idea is students will come in while they're working on their aerospace engineering degrees, aerospace management degrees, business degrees. Uh, We've got one school, Purdue, that's even been talking about sending students from their educational, their school of education to kind of get a space emphasis to education, business, what have you. And so the idea is to take people that are already being trained at the best universities in the United States as engineers, businessmen, um, and turn them into real space cadets. And I think this is going to help them. This is going to help them become the leaders of the future. And you know, we put this together with the International Space University, which has been at the forefront of teaching space since 1985. We pulled a faculty together from around the world, really. We've got faculty coming from several different universities, the Aerospace Corporation, International Space University. Uh, we've got what I think is the lead space entrepreneurship professor coming in to teach with Greg Autry. We've got Ken Davidian coming in from um, the FAA. Henry Hertzfeld, who runs the Space Policy Institute in Washington, is going to be teaching with me as well. We've got, um, you know, the magic of Florida because, you know, one of the great things about Florida, they said, is we have lots of launches. And you know what happens when you have a launch? Everybody has to show up. But, you know, the truth is, a lot of the, the senior executives come in and they do the launch readiness review and then they sit around for a day. So, you know, we're going to take advantage of those people being around for the launches and, and interact with them and do some workshops with our students and faculty. And, um, you know, as, as you mentioned, we start teaching the summer, basically four full college courses in six weeks. So students are going to be really busy. Andy, it sounds like amazing access to the caliber of, of executive and business leaders that come through there. 
you know, the faculty that are, are running this, but also the people who are going to come in and guest lecture and be part of this. Um, uh, really, really privileged to be able to have access to that. And you're also talking about um, building in launches um, uh, to the program and access to launches for students yep. to view from a VIP viewing uh, area, um, which is really cool. Um, and I always like to say that um, <laughs> when I envision this, I'm thinking of uh, that sci-fi movie, Gattaca, with Ethan Hawke and Uma Thurman and Jude Law where they have an academy where they teach space travel essentials. And um, I just imagine you're going in and you're studying space and entrepreneurship and you know, you're know you hearing from all these business leaders and launches are going off in the background out the window. Yeah. And it just seems like a really incredible experience. And then also you've got it in a, in a pretty special room, right? A pretty special yeah, I facility. Didn't, I, didn't, I didn't mention that. So, uh, yeah, we're teaching the whole program at the visitor complex at the Kennedy Space Center. So at times we're going to be having lectures literally in a Mars base that they've done at the at the visitor complex. You know, students can go out in between classes and hang out under the shuttle Atlantis and some of the amazing um, facilities that they've got there. And I also got to say, um, you know, one of the things that makes this different from I think almost any academic program I'm aware of is at the tail end of this whole thing. Uh, you know, Chad, you're going to be there with your space angels looking at the ideas that these students are developing, the business concepts are developing. And I, I think you're going to find some interesting investment opportunities for you and the students are going to find some interesting job opportunities. Yeah. And that's one of the main reasons why we're so excited to be involved. Um, and, and it's a bit bigger than this too. So you mentioned Purdue. Um, yeah. But you're also working with a number of other organizations and schools that have caught wind of what you're doing and, and wanted to be involved as well, right? Yeah. When we originally proposed, we had five other universities and we're working with them to ensure that the students get credit uh, back at their home universities for their master's degree. So we started out with Purdue, Ohio State, uh, University of Florida, University of Central Florida, Embry-Riddle University. We've actually added a couple that we're we're talking to right now, you know, we're building a team, you know, it's going to be ultimately global. So yeah. Um, and we've got some great partners, of course, the space angels, aerospace corporation and Delaware North space, Florida. It's, um, it's not just a great team of institutions, but it's a great team of people. Yeah. And that's an important point as well, that this is an accredited program, right? It's, it is. So you would, um, envision, uh, students come out of this, uh, they, they sign up for this program and they do it over the summer and they come out at the end with a degree from their university with a certificate in space studies. Right. They'll have a certificate in commercial and entrepreneurial space studies. And it's part of the Florida tech curriculum. So for example, we've, we've already got an MBA program with an emphasis in commercial space, a master's in engineering management with an emphasis in commercial space at Florida tech. And we hope that other universities will create similar emphasis in their programs as well. Okay. So how do we register? Let's say that I'm a student considering a um, program at Florida Institute of Technology, and I see that they've got the certificate, and so I get excited. Uh, as a new student, how do I register? And then also, if I'm an existing student, how would I register? Having right. just First thing aware? is isucse.fit.edu. Go to the website. You, it'll take you to a registration page, and uh, you can file your application today. We'd like to get all the registrations handled by the end of April so we can start getting students their pre-reading materials. And I guess the other thing that's important is we're capping this at 50 students. We never, we never want this to become a big engineering 101 kind of auditorium experience. Mm -hmm. it's, it's intended to be very interactive and, you know, we want to create a cohort of students that are going to continue to work together. When I did my MBA program, it was actually something very similar to this. It was a consortium of uh, London School of Economics, the Brown Nicole of Commerce in Paris, and um, New York University. And we had a cohort of just 50 students sort of travel the globe together. And I'm probably closer with my students that that I attended that program with than any of the other schools that, that I've been to. So I think there's 
really tremendous value in bringing a diverse team of students from around the world with different disciplines working together towards really common goals. So uh, there, I think there's magic in it. Certainly. It sounds like a, an amazing program, something that I wish was around um, when I was back <laughs> going to school. Um, so certainly happy to be involved um, and excited to, to see this take off. So uh, before we go, um, on the show, we like to say that there has never been a better time to get involved in space investing. Can you right. give us your personal perspective on that and um, which areas are the most exciting for you? Well, it's, I think that there has never been a more important time to invest in space, probably never been more opportunity. What I worry about is there's probably also there's a substantial amount of risk today. And so I think it's never been more important to be a smart investor. If only there was an organization that existed where people could go and get some information about investing in space. <laughs> well, I can help them with that, too. They're all welcome to the Center for Space Entrepreneurship. And as you know, Chad, we're going to be doing some workshops that are really focused specifically on the idea of helping make people a little bit smarter about their investments in space. Right. And we're going to be announcing those very soon. And we're looking forward to yep. that. Andy, it has been great talking with you. Thanks very much for your time today. It's been my pleasure, Chad. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for tuning into the Space Angels podcast. A link to register for the Center for Space Entrepreneurship program is available in the show notes for this episode. If you're interested in learning more about space startups, I invite you to visit our website, spaceangels.com, where you can learn all about Space Angels membership and how you can get involved in this exciting new sector.